I will begin with the end, showing here the first test sailing of MS Bel Air in September 2006, after we had launched her the 13th of June 2006, and then finished some interior details in the months in between. On board, beside myself, was the crew of three, the captain, a sailor, and the cook, in addition to my brother Jacob, who had come with his wife Jane to make the video, and my daughter Celine. The test was successful, and I was enormously relieved after two years of construction, my hair rising shipbuilding adventure had finally succeeded. Now follow the story about this project, how it came about, and the details of design and construction with its trials and tribulations that I had to overcome to reach a successful conclusion. I have no head for heights and can assure you that during the construction, I sometimes felt like I was climbing Mount Everest having vertigo. In my last film about the racehorses, I mentioned that everything happens for a reason, and my shipbuilding adventure is no exception. So here goes my story. In January 1998, I had rented a four-bedroom villa with magnificent views to the sea halfway up the mountainside in Ezebord Mer. Driving from Nice, one passes Villefrance, then Beaulieu-sur-Mer, and then one arrives at Ezebord Mer. Situated 427 meters above is the medieval Aise village, halfway between Nice and Monaco, where I had my office apartment. During the first six years, I tried to persuade the owner to sell the villa to me, and in January 2003, I finally succeeded. At that time, nothing was further from my mind than getting involved in building a sailing yacht. I negotiated a good price on the villa, and my bank in Monaco verbally accepted my request for a loan to complete the purchase. I signed the contract on the villa, but three weeks later, the bank called and said they could not provide the loan because they had not realized that I would be too old to insure before the end of the term of the loan. I was greatly disappointed, so that is the main reason I came to build MS Bel Air. In that period, I had received a circular email from a Turkish yacht agency called Satko Yachting, offering a 24-meter motor sailing yacht for sale, and it made me think, why not have a look at this boat? I booked tickets to fly to Bodrum, Turkey, and asked my son Oliver to come with me. We sailed with the yacht the short distance of nine kilometers from Bodrum to the Greek island of Kos, I inexplicably threw caution to the wind and did not check the people of the yacht agency. I would build a new one and asked him to set up a contract. It's crazy but true. But no risk, no gain. As I said earlier, everything happens for a reason. Satku hired space for the construction in a shipyard situated by the beach 15 kilometers south of Bodrum. I had required that the hull should be constructed in steel, so they got a specialist to come from a large shipyard in Istanbul to start the construction, which commenced in April 2004. I hired a naval architect and marine engineer and having set up a construction agreement with Satku, stipulating the maximum price 
with a budget limit and various conditions, including a time limit for the completion of the yacht, the project started. Here are the details of my first design, color scheme and the steel construction trials and tribulations that I had to overcome throughout the construction. I followed the progress of the construction closely and started flying to Bodrum from May 2004, sometimes twice a month, the next two years. And already three months into the construction, I started getting worried as when I came in July, no one was working on the hull. And by October, there was only a hollow shell in steel standing in the yard. After many calls and emails, they assured me that work would progress faster over the winter. By November 2004, I suspected that they were going to exceed not only the time limit, but also the budget. However, now there was only one way, and that was forward. In the summer of 2005, they requested it necessary to buy in more teak for the deck and mahogany for the cladding of cabins, etc. As we had already bought 52 tons of class one mahogany, I questioned why they needed more teak and mahogany. And I discovered that a lot of the wood had been stolen. So in the end, I probably paid twice for what was needed. An ocean-going yacht of 30 meters and 94 tons is like a house. It must be self-sustaining in every way. And a decision had to be made on the length and weight of the main mast, 25 meters, and the mizzen mast of 23 meters. While I was busy negotiating with Caterpillar, buying two engines, each of 360 horsepower, two large generators, 37 kilowatts, 18 large batteries, and a water maker producing 150 liters an hour, converting salt water to fresh water. In addition to numerous items like a gangway called a passerella, furniture, washing machine, kitchen equipment, etc., etc., etc. Many additional delays and costs of materials continued 2005, 2006. And by the time Bel Air was ready to launch, a veritable nightmare was presented to me by the owner of the shipyard, who refused to launch Bel Air because he was unknown to me, owed 10,000 euros by Satco. I was presented with a fait accompli. Only if I paid him the money there and then would he launch Bel Air. So I had no choice but to sign a promissory note for the money, money that I had already paid to Sadko. Needless to say, I was livid, but I had to get Bel Air in the water and away from there. Caterpillar had set the condition that one of their engineers should be on board when we launched, and I watched my Bel Air gliding gently into the water the 13th of June 2006 at 11.07. I shall never forget that day. The picture is engraved in my mind. While Bel Air sailed the 15 kilometers to Bodrum, the engineer checked that the engines were set and working correctly, and I booked a mooring in the port of Bodrum. The euphoria of the launch was short-lived. As we anchored, Captain Cara informed me that we were taking water in through a hole just under the inside of our dirty water tank. I phoned around along the coast to find a port with a 100-ton lift. I found the lift in Tuco Trees, one hour sailing north of Bodrum, and we went straight there. 
Bel Air was lifted out of the water and in the meantime I had arranged for a mechanic to meet us and welding closed the hole. The problem solved, it had been yet another worrying experience when I had to find a solution instantly. After two years of construction, I now had to prepare myself for further problems. So after a veritable confrontation with Satku on the case side, who refused to hand over the certification, the license and the passport for Bel Air, I instructed Captain Kara to lift anchor immediately, not knowing where to go. After conversation with the captain, we set course for the idyllic Karaka, so good bay, situated at the bottom of the Gulf of Gokuba, four and a half hours sailing from Bodum, and I decided to anchor Bel Air there for the winter 2006-2007. Well on our way, we had a wonderful theatrical company of lovely dolphins displaying all their skills along the side and in front of the bow as if they were throwing us the way. Realizing that it was Satku's intention to control Bel Air, so without the ship's papers I had to react fast. Upon our arrival in Caracas circuit, I rented a car in Marmaris and drove back to Bodrum where I contacted my accountant who called a customs captain in Izmir, three hours away by car. He informed us that all the money that I had transferred during the construction must have been declared to the bank by Satko as payment for the boat. And if they had not declared it, then for a fee of 3,000, he would drive to Bodum and present Satko with a fine of 80,000 euros unless they handed over the ship's document to me within a week. Needless to say, I got all the documents six days later. The tale will have it that the Egyptian queen Cleopatra had met with the Roman commander Antonius on the island, swimming together in the bay. We found the ruin of an ancient Greek theatre, so there may be some truth in the story. Who knows? I took a photo of my brother with his wife and my daughter, Celine, sitting in the theatre. Still, my real-life thriller did not end there. At first, Captain Kara had seemed reliable enough, but again I was proven wrong. In the spring of 2007, I received an invitation from the mayor of Marmaris to use Bel Air for an inauguration party in the Bay of Marmaris, offering that they paid the expenses of the diesel and a fee for one day sailing and all expenses while anchored in the bay. The event took place as planned and the following day I arrived by plane. I asked Captain Kara to come with me to an agency in Marmaris that I had an appointment with. Meanwhile, I told him to go to the bank and collect 15,000 euro that I had transferred for payment of salaries to the crew and some works to be done on the boat. I gave him to Monday morning and after he left, I asked my sailor to take his belongings, look for his license and if he did not return by Monday morning, to throw overboard all except his license. He did not come back, so I took his license to the yacht agency in Marmaris and they sent out an alert to all the ports on the Turkish coast that Captain Kara had disappeared with 15,000 euros. Finding myself in the Bay of Marmaris with one young sailor, I called an agency in Bodrum and they sent me a temporary captain who came and sailed 
Bel Air back to Bootum, and later I heard that he had boasted getting away with stealing the money. Honestly, it was like a real life thriller. Anyway, I started taking charters from the spring of 2007 through 2008, and after two more Turkish captains since launching Bel Air, I finally found a young, reliable and good captain in 2008 that continued to be captain on Bel Air for 13 years and he has continued to work for the new owners. I continued to charter out Bel Air and in the summer of 2008 we sailed Bel Air up to Athens through the Corinth Canal to Corfu. A great experience. I had Russian friends who bought 50% of Bel Air and having paid three times as much as stated in the original contract, I needed to recuperate at least half of the money. This arrangement carried on for another two years when in 2010 the Russians bought the other half of Bel Air. In 2012, I sold Bel Air on behalf of them to a German client who continued with my young captain. That is the end of the story about the most challenging and eventful project of my life. When in trouble, you sink or you swim. And I had to swim very fast. And as you saw from the start of this film, I did not drown, but succeeded in spite of extremely difficult circumstances, 2,000 kilometers from home and dealing with a Middle Eastern culture. Could I have set myself a more difficult task? I don't know. But what I do know is that I gained a vast experience and participating in the Bodrum Raketa in October 2007 with a crew of 12 sailors, we finished number 25 out of 100 boats. And I can assure you that there's nothing like racing along at a 45 degree angle with a strong wind behind us in baking sunshine, smelling the salt hitting your face head on.